it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. My house sits at the threshold of evil by James Caligo. There's a saying in the new town I've moved into, don't move here. Well, I wish I could have found that out sooner rather than later. But unfortunately, I'd found myself in the clutches of a messy divorce that forced me to move to this small town in southern Illinois, a town called Auburndale. Well, that alone wasn't bad, I mean, besides the fact that I had to live in Illinois, but that alone wasn't the reason for the horrific nightmare that I found myself stuck in. Uh, my current trouble started on the day of moving into an old house, built with two stories, but unpainted and with signs of rot desecrating the outside wood. I had on my hands a nasty case of a fixer-upper, but, well, that might be therapeutic for me for the time being. Yes, I needed to stop thinking about her and how she'd run off with my brother. I thought perhaps working with my hands would be beneficial for me in the end. <sighs> if only that would have been the case. I went out of the back of the house and took a good look at the rocky cliffs behind, dropping down some 50 to 60 feet. Down below was a beautiful stretch of trees that were already changing to the luscious colours of autumn, red, orange and yellow. The crisp air was already nipping at my face. Well, I thought I could work with this. Just have to get a heater for my bedroom. Nevertheless, I was going to have to get as much of the essential stuff running as quickly as possible. I got the house quite cheap for a good reason. There was no electricity, gas, or any of the other essential stuff that we need these days. And I was soon worried about when I'd get to take my next shower. Now, if you ask anyone in town, they'd say that the house had been abandoned for all they knew. I had a battery-powered heater which I hoped might last through the night. First time I'd ever used one of these. I preferred to sleep in a sleeping bag on top of my bed instead of a simple blanket. That's just about all I could manage at this time. Now, just as I was about to fall asleep, I heard something outside. A loud groaning sound that resembled the sound of an elk pierced through the woods. But there was something completely off about it. The echoing never ceased and it kept travelling through my house as well as across the surrounding land. Never was it impeded by the trees or the walls. Uh, definitely spooky, but I didn't bother to worry about it for the time being. Well, as far as I was concerned, it was just the natural wildlife outside. After I'd finished making some instant coffee the next morning, I went out to the back to take in the fresh woodland air. It seemed like the best kind of thing to do to get used to this new lifestyle that I'd found myself in. Upon stepping towards the edge, I stepped on something slimy, meaty even. Hidden in the tall grass was the carcass of a mutilated animal. It may have been some sort of gopher, that I'm not too certain of due to it appearing to have been ripped completely apart. I wasn't happy about this discovery. Already my new boots were getting blood tracked all over them. Ah, oh, damn it, I shouted angrily. I was well aware that I wasn't going to get anywhere with cleaning them here. Uh, the best I could do was to scrape the blood and meat off on the grass. Now, this wasn't a pleasant sight. I was actually angry that something had killed its prey in my yard. Oh, I'm going to need to get something from the store to deal with this problem, I said to myself. After I went back in to get ready, I heard something far off in the distance, far out in the woods, making a wailing, shrill call. What in God's name? I went to the window and looked out. There was nothing, just like before. At the supermarket, I was getting some raccoon repellent and some other supplies to help me fix up the house. Once I'd gotten all that, I stood in line and immediately I ended up striking up a conversation with this man behind me. Ah, see you doing a little home improvement, eh? I turned around, trying to hide my nerves that had been bugging me the entire time since I'd heard that sound. Oh, at least, yes, yeah, a little something to get that water system running. I believe I have well water. He chuckled and said, 
<laughs> our mate, and extended his hand. I did the same, and as we shook hands, I replied, Henry. So, um, you mentioned that your water isn't working. Why is that? I, um, I felt a little self-conscious about mentioning that house. The one that's all dilapidated and an eyesore for the rest of the town with its vintage homes that have been kept nice and well decorated while mine is this rotten blight. I, um, I don't know. Ah, you don't know? He asked again. Yeah, yeah, it's just that I bought the wrecked house by the cliffside. His expression changed so rapidly once I'd said that. But he asked again, clearly for confirmation of what I'd said. You don't mean... Oh, oh my God, they're still trying to sell that place? What's wrong? I asked, becoming increasingly unnerved by this conversation's sudden turn. He told me that we should check out first before he explained further about an old town legend in the area. Once that was over, we stood outside the store and talked. Well, he had such a grim tone in his voice that he hadn't had before. He, uh, if I were you, I wouldn't stay in that place for a single night. Oh, you could offer me millions of dollars and I wouldn't do it. Yeah? Why's that? That house isn't in a uh, good location, so to speak. Well, there's been a string of murders tied up with it. Well, upon hearing that, I became agitated that the realtor hadn't told me about that. Yeah, I um, already stayed there last night and nothing happened. Ah, uh, could be a week. Could be a month. Shoot, it could take a whole year before that thing in the woods just beyond the cliffsides takes notice that you're in its hands. Well, back it up. What thing are you talking about? Yeah, there's a creature living in those woods, man. When it finds out that you're inside the house, it won't be happy. When I'd say trying to get that place up and running again is going to be a dead giveaway of your presence. Well, I can't live without water and electricity. And he cut me off. You shouldn't be living in that house, period. If you don't want to end up in the obituaries in an early grave, I suggest you pack up your things and book it. I can't. I have nowhere else to go. Hey, the streets will be kinder to you. I can tell you that there's plenty of motels around here that'll let you stay. Go to the Auburndale Motel down Westshire Avenue. The guy who runs the place knows about that house, and he'll let you stay for a few days for free so you can get yourself back on your feet without worrying about your pocket change. Well, I took a few steps back, gripping tighter around my bags. I was trying my best not to look so visibly angry at him. But, well, my face must have betrayed me. He could tell that I wasn't happy and said, Hey, I live here. When you're ready to get out there real quick, you can stay here for a day or so. My wife might get a little grouchy, but she'll understand the situation. He handed me a quickly written note then and took a few more things back from me, concluding that this conversation was over. We exchanged goodbyes, but deep down I was hoping I wouldn't have to deal with him again. I wasn't about to abandon my home over some silly old town legend. Well, back home, I set everything down on the floor at the front door. I went into the kitchen to see if I could cook up some coffee packets. I was going to need a triple shot espresso for this day. I had a lot of work to do on those pipes. Well, that was easier said than done. Once I'd had my coffee and started working on some of the pipes down in the basement, I struggled to deal with what I found. All these weird items from companies stretching all the way back to the 30s. Vintage Coca-Cola cans. An old tire wheel that looked like it belonged to a car from the 20s. And a bunch of other garbage that I wasn't keen on keeping around. Although I thought a can of Coca-Cola might be worth something. Well, once I got to work on the pipes, I took one off and saw that it was completely rusted through. Oh, I'm glad I bought the appropriate size for the replacement. The real problem was how I was barely able to get any more pipes off. And they were so rusted that a lot of them almost looked like they were merged into one. Well, there was also this sticky, brownish goo that covered certain corners of the basement. One particularly nasty corner in the front right of the house was set with an organized circle of candles and a bowl filled with that brown goo. 
What exactly it was, I wasn't ditching to find out. Part of me wanted to clean this stuff up, just in case it was toxic, but then again, maybe I should hire some professionals to fix my house after all. I was losing motivation fast to try and deal with all these problems. I just wanted my utilities back on. I did give up. I walked back upstairs to make a few phone calls in the meantime. But I kept feeling an unusual chill down my spine every time I took a look out of the back window of the kitchen. For a brief moment, I thought I saw a light blink through some of the trees. When it was already dusk outside, the sun had gone down, but the light was still partially there. What was even more frightening was that it looked as if the blinking light was getting closer to my house. Well, that night, those words from Nate haunted me. Well, I locked my door because at this point I was having second feelings about staying here. Oh, how I wish he wouldn't have told me all that stuff. Well, thankfully, everything was quiet for the first few hours. I did manage to fall asleep until, that is, around 4 a.m. I say 4 a.m. because that's when I was interrupted from my sleep by a piercing elk scream. I jumped out of my bed, a rush of adrenaline hitting me quick. That sounded like it was inside my house. I heard a crashing sound below. Going downstairs, I was just about to go down to the basement, but realized that I needed a weapon if I was to deal with some home intruder. I ran into the kitchen to grab a knife, but briefly glanced out of the window. I saw something rushing off towards the cliff. Once it did, it started walking down the pathway that led down. In its hand was a staff with a candle-lit lantern attached at the top. It was draped in a cloak with a hood obscuring its head from my limited field of vision. Well, from what I could see poking out from the hood, there were two long tusks that were probably a foot long each. But I could have sworn that I saw something else. Something like a mask. An animal skull mask but it was gone before I could even process what I was seeing in deeper detail. Well, after that encounter, I quickly called 911. As I was waiting for them, I wanted to quickly check the basement. Going down there, I didn't see any of the windows broken, but I knew that he'd come down here because there were pieces of paper scattered all over the place, as well as one of the shelves that was attached to the walls having been torn out. Creeped out by the darkness down there, I'm worried about my intruder coming back. I went back up and stayed outside the front, waiting for the flashing lights of the cops. A cop did eventually show up. Well, he looked apprehensive, with his sunken blue eyes and a large moustache like Joseph Stalin. Honestly, though, he looked as if he was the man himself. But he had three long scars around his neck that his collar wasn't quite covering. You the homeowner? I said yes to his question, I was expecting him to do a quick search of the house. But he didn't do anything of the sort, instead proceeding to lecture me, which I wasn't expecting. You decided to move into the house, yeah? Uh, I hate to tell you this, son, but I already know that there's nothing we can do to help you. I was practically appalled by the inaction and lack of sympathy for what I'd gone through. <laughs> Excuse me, someone broke into my house and... You're not even going to try and figure out who or how they got in. He rolled his eyes and, with a raspy voice, told me that he was already done with this conversation, saying, Did you see the suspect? <laughs> Kinda. What did it look like? The fact that he used the word it instead of him or them told me enough that this wasn't the first time that cops had been called out to this house. They were well aware of the situation. They, uh, they were wearing a cloak. Yeah, so, um, like I said, there's nothing that we can do to help you. Whatever this thing is, it's beyond our abilities to handle. You'd be better off taking your chances up with getting help from a private investigator. Well, I wasn't able to talk back to this man. Well, he just went back to his cop car and drove away. The apathy that I was experiencing was jarring, and I never expected the police to be so disconnected from my situation. 
but perhaps my intruder was something that the police were not equipped to deal with, and they decided it wasn't worth the effort to even try. That didn't make it any better, despite the rationale. And I kept thinking about Nate. He told me something about how the town didn't like this house. And part of me felt like I should adhere to their fears about the home and jump ship. But I wasn't in the mood to try and start all over again. Maybe I should give it one more night and spend the day trying to figure out how this thing got into the basement to begin with. The next morning I made it my mission to look around through the basement and figure out how this thing had got in. From what I could remember, it stood on two legs and it was not going to garner any attention from the police. I wasn't in a position where I could move out immediately and I wasn't ready to abandon the house yet. I'd already spent the money on buying it, and I wasn't exactly keen on ending it this way. But no matter where I looked in the basement, I saw nothing except the piles of rubbish and trash that littered and were stacked up onto the walls. I spent possibly three hours just trying to look for something, but still I saw that it was nothing but that brown goo and debris. I sat down on the steps, resting my head back uncomfortably, but having no will to try and go up the rest of them. I took several deep breaths, my hands aching from the hours of working with them. My God, this sucks, I muttered in frustration. I took a quick survey of the room around me, wondering if maybe I was going about this all wrong. Perhaps there was indeed a hole nearby. I'd thought that maybe there was a window that was cluttered over, but perhaps there was actually a genuinely large hole that the creature was crawling through. So I spent another two hours just throwing shelves and bookcases around, trying to clear away as much as I could from the walls. And after doing all of that, I found... <sighs> Nothing, I sighed, defeatedly. Practically on the verge of tears, I gave up and went upstairs to rest in my bed. After all of that, I couldn't find any entrance as to how this creature could have come in. And a part of me had another fear working its way into me. Would it be back tonight? I didn't have a gun license, so naturally I didn't have a gun. I was going to have to use anything else that could be a weapon to handle this situation to the best of my abilities. And so something blunt or something sharp would have to make do. Not to ease my mind, I went out to the town to grab some more tools to work with. And maybe even learn a little bit about my problem. Unfortunately, I wasn't ready to confront Nate about it again. So I guess you could say... I went out to get a second opinion. I saw a church. I knew that I could get some information from them. Since the building looks like it's been here for decades, possibly even a century. Well, I never liked being in a religious building. To me, there was nothing great about these institutions. But I was desperate, and I needed answers. Hopefully the new shovel I got would help with searching for holes in my basement. A pastor noticed that I was looking around and approached me. Hello, uh, have you come to pray? Um, no, no, that wasn't the reason for my visit. I just have some questions about some town lore. Well, I wouldn't have chosen this place for something like that. The library is always open to those who want valuable information about the town. Yeah, I know, but um, I bought the house on the cliff. I was hoping that you'd have some knowledge about its history. His face grimaced, and I could see the creases of his wrinkles folding as he looked as if he was overwhelmed with a wave of grief. His voice, at first as sweet as any friendly, sympathetic old man could be, now deepened into a serious and slightly colder tone. Get out of that house. Well, he was practically ordering me. Wh wh why, though? But it's uh, not necessarily the house that's the problem. It's just that it borders on the realm of something evil in the woods beneath those cliffs. A monster, a being so grotesque that it wiped out all Native American tribes in the area. I sat down on the stairs of the speaker's platform and listened as he explained further. In the late 1800s, when this town was finally going up, a rich man who was also an owner of the opium trade going on in China built one of his homes on that cliffside, the house you currently inhabit. For a few months, his staff reported that they 
Well, occasionally, they'd hear something in the basement or in the attic. Then, on one September afternoon, a gardener said he heard something at the edge of the pathway and decided to go check it out. He never returned. There was no screaming of any sort. No, it was just as if he'd wandered towards the edge, entered the domain of the woods down below, and, well, vanished. I was curious about the Native Americans, so I asked him about their story. Uh, reports are sketchy. From what we know, they arrived here sometime in the 1400s. They only lasted for about a year before their entire tribe was wiped out. They weren't even allowed to leave because a subsequent snowstorm ravaged the area and forced them to hunker down. And during that time, their numbers were being whittled away by the creature in those woods. What is it? Well, at this point, I was thinking that it would be something supernatural. Well, this is a church, and this was a pastor. So I was expecting something that could, well, would coincide with his fate. It is not from Earth. It came from the stars and landed here many thousands of years ago, devouring any life forms that come within the vicinity of those woods. And, I hate to say, that house just so happens to be too close to its home. Well, I definitely hadn't expected a pastor of all people to give me that answer. I would have expected an astronomer or biologist to give me that, or maybe more so a conspiracy theorist. Is there, um, nothing I can do to get it out? Ah, many tried. That rich man I mentioned earlier, his whole staff was eventually wiped out. He ended up gathering a search party to go into the woods and look for them because the last thing he heard was that they were all being dragged out towards those trees. Well, the search party never returned either. Nothing and no one ever gets out. I swallowed. I realized that I knew where this was going. Clearly there had to be more to this story, though. How many people have inhabited that house before me? He stroked his chin for a moment and contemplated what he was going to say next. I could tell he wasn't comfortable with what he had to say. Dozens of people have come and gone. And by gone, I mean they were viciously torn apart by something that hunts people like a ravenous animal, but has the intelligence of something far beyond human. I believe I um, remember someone. I think it was the cop. He said something about a family... There have been so many people who were unaware, believing that they were getting a good deal on such a fixer-upper house, that they, well, they ended up becoming just another list of people on the victim's list. After hearing all of that, I thanked him for the information and realized I had to make a decision. Could I really go back to the house and face off against something that rattled everyone in this town down to their very cause? A monster that stalks and massacres any who try to make a home too close to it. Already the day was getting late. I decided to play a game of chance. I went back to the house to spend one more night. If I had another situation with the creature, I'd have to get out. But I was going to keep all of my stuff packed up just to make sure. I was still thinking that I could keep this thing out of the house if I could just find out where it was hiding in that hole in the basement. I kept poking around with the shovel, trying to see if I could cave in a secret entrance somewhere in the walls or on the floor. Still, I got nothing, and it was already getting late. There was no more light outside, and I was relying heavily on candles at this point. I was just about ready to quit, but I decided to take one more swing at the crumpled flooring. I lifted the shovel high, but accidentally hit the roof in the process. I just rammed right through the floorboards on the first floor, and I was now really mad with my own stupid decision. Here I was destroying my house even further, trying to figure out if something was getting in through the basement, through a secret passage that, no matter where I looked for it, seemed impossible. There was nothing. All the walls were solid. Oh god, this sucks. I shouted in frustration and started swinging the shovel down hard onto the ground kept chipping away at the broken concrete until something caught my eye once my raging moment had passed. I lifted and I moved closer towards a strange formation of different material that didn't match the aging concrete colouring. 
God, is... Is that a... It was. It was a bone. The lower jaw of a human skull. Well, my heart was racing and I was just about ready to leave that room right then and there. Grab all of my clothes, get out of this house, and go to that motel that I was told would be a safe place for me. But there was this vibration running through the floor, and all of the cans down there started to shake ever so slightly. Something was moving. I quickly ran behind one of the bookcases that I'd pulled away from the wall, and I hid. Well, as I said, I'm not all that religious, but let's just say that I was praying for certain this time. The room started to fill with this hushed whispering. I covered my ears, but came to the horrifying realization that they were inside my head. When I peeked around the corner of the bookcase, the wall facing opposite to the stairs had begun to ripple like water. I honestly couldn't understand what was going on. Then a long skeletal hand pierced through the brick wall then the rest of the arm, and then the whole body came through. I'd left my candles burning still, so I was able to get a good look at the monstrosity that stood before me. I'd say it was around six foot five inches. It had appendages that were mostly just bones, with only a little flesh keeping them attached to one another, mainly around the joints. But I did see something else. Whatever it was, it was strapped in black shoulder plating, a large grey robe that covered its leather under armour, and it had large blood-soaked black boots. Its arms were long and fingers were twice the length of a human's. But even after all of that, its face was the most hideous part to look at. I was trembling just from the sight of its dear skull face, and where its eyes should be, a blue light was emitting. It had two long tusks coming out from the sides of its lower jaw, and two long horns that were curving inwards towards each other just straight above its head. It started walking again, after taking its brief look around the room. I quickly retreated back behind the bookcase, hoping it wasn't aware of my presence. It walked with a heavy clanking of its metal boots, it went up the stairs, unaware of my existence and it was scraping something metal against the rotten wood. When I peeked around the corner, I saw that it had a long broadsword in its left hand. I could hear it walking around the first floor, opening doors. Now I knew for certain that it was looking for me. And now this was nothing more than a nightmare that I just wanted to wake up from. When I moved from my hiding place and went a little closer to the steps, I wonder how long it would take before the creature gave up. Then I heard it ascend to the next floor. I could hear then the thrashing around of my stuff, and that's what was getting under my skin. It had destroyed all of my things, and now it was waiting for me. Well, I wasn't going to have it. I went up to the first floor, quietly. Then I saw that I still had my gasoline tanks, which were originally meant for mowing the lawn, that I'd left in the living room. With stealthy caution, I dumped the gasoline all over the first floor as quickly as I could. I was wondering what that creature was doing. I hadn't heard it since it had gone up there. Almost, I whispered to myself. Almost what? A deep, snake-like voice came from behind me. I jumped and dropped the gasoline tank, and when I turned around... That thing was standing right behind me, lurking right over me. I took as many steps as I could back towards the wall, attempting to burn down my house. Pathetic. What are you? It moved closer, with the clanking of its boots making my heart jump each time it did. I am the eons beyond humanity's time on this world. I ruled this world first, until your kind started showing up. You relegated me to my small dwelling, and occasionally tried to take that from me too. But I will not yield. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't know you lived here. 
while I was on the verge of tears and trying to plead for some sort of mercy from this otherwise malicious entity. It's no issue. I'm an understanding fellow. It just so happens that I uh, have the taste for human flesh. Realizing what that entailed, the creature opened its mouth wide and was about to take a huge chomp out of my face. But I ducked to my left, desperately hoping to find the matches in the kitchen. Oh, the creature howled like an angry elk, chasing after me, walking just like a man. Well, that alone was bizarre. Once I was in the kitchen, I grabbed the matches and tried to strike one. The first one failed, so I was forced to pull out another one as the creature increasingly closed the gap between us. Well, it couldn't run, I guess, or... Maybe it was just so confident that it would catch me. Either way, I had to keep walking backwards out into the hallway that exited onto the dining room. We briefly walked around in circles, around this old dining room table, the creature holding up its sword and smashing through it. Finally, I managed to light the second one. And then I dropped it to the ground, hoping that this would be it for this thing. Well, I hadn't fought far ahead. I was still stuck in the house. In a panic, I used my shoe to quickly kill the flame, hoping that it wouldn't catch any of the gasoline. <sighs> You're running out of matches, it laughed. And it was right. I only had one left. We went back into the kitchen, and the creature relaxed a little. Well, I was almost insulted by how it was taking its leisurely time with me. I desperately kept trying to light another match, but no matter how many times I tried, nothing worked. It was dead. A dead match. My eyes were so fixated on this creature now that I couldn't run. I'd locked the door earlier, and that would give it the time it needed to grab me and finish me off. It was over for me. The creature laughed some more then. And it slid across the tile flooring, saying... Oh, how tragic. I will say you put up a better fight than most of my previous victims. And for that, I'll give you a warrior's way out of this life. And it slid its sword real fast to give me a quick chop. But just then a burst of flames erupted in the kitchen that was slowly travelling across the floor. The scraping of the sword against the aged tile had ended up causing sparks on the ground without even realizing it. It cried out in pain, as its body was quickly engulfed in flames. I, on the other hand, spent no more time there. I ran for the door, glad that I didn't have the gasoline over this section. Once I was outside, I was able to catch my breath and turn around as the flames quickly engulfed the dried-up wood inside, and that creature was still wailing. But it was over. Everything was over. Well, after the whole incident, I was fortunately able to file for insurance. I'm so glad I went out and got this when I first got the house. Well, the story I went with was that one of my gasoline tanks had fallen over and there was an electrical fire. And thankfully, that story was able to stick. With the money I was able to get, I could just about move into a simple mobile home in a different town. Well, this was much better, and there was no cosmic monster that was living close by in this town, thankfully. Well, uh, despite what I believe I saw, I don't think the creature really died in the fire. I went back about a week after the whole place had burned to the ground. It was late at night, and I just wanted to have a bit of reassurance that it was gone. When I went to the edge of the cliff, I looked down at the forest and thought about how beautiful it was. I was now in a rather melancholy mood about the whole ordeal. Oh, how nice it would have been to have woken up every day to see such a beautiful sight. But something caught my eye for a brief moment. When I looked down, I could have sworn I saw a bright light moving under the trees, like a lantern flashing through the leaves, followed by the call of an elk howling. Part 2 Life has been difficult since I escaped from Obendale. 
That obscure town in southern Illinois was something that I was going to put behind me. But I've recently been developing an illness ever since my encounter with that thing. It all started in November. I was getting back in my trailer, preparing to shave my whiskers, when I happened to take a look at my right arm. I had been feeling itchy for quite some time now. I never thought it was serious until today. Well, there was an apparent discoloration around the joint between the forearm and my upper arm. My entire elbow was starting to turn into a brownish colour, similar to that weird sticky stuff that was in the basement of the old house. And I caught something from touching it. The sight alone was enough to get my heart beating rapidly, and I had half a mind to take my razor blade and start cutting it out. Oh, my mind was racing, wondering what had happened to me. Upon further inspection, I noticed it was flowing through my veins, slowly changing them as it went. Thankfully, though, this meant that I had plenty of time to try and get it fixed. But I didn't want to go to a doctor, not with this. Well, for all I know, they might just lock me up and run experiments on me, as if I'm some kind of biological threat to humanity or something. Burning it also wasn't going to be an option. The fact that it was already spreading through my veins was enough to tell me that the damage had been done. The only logical solution now would be to force an amputation before it gets to the rest of my body. But who's to say that even that would work? How do I know it hasn't already spread to my whole body and this is just one of the symptoms? Then I'd be down an arm and still get nowhere. Well, I wasn't going to have a lot of options rather than to do one. Return to Auburndale. Return to that threshold of evil. So I packed lightly, decided to call ahead this time and set myself up in a motel. The same motel I'd ended up spending time at after my house had burned down. The drive back in was, well, nerve-wracking at best. At worst, I wanted to drive myself off the side of the road and convince myself yet again that I can't return. Now, I know that sounds drastic, but think of it like this. Would you ever want to go back inside a cage with a man-eating tiger? That thing tried to eat me last time. If fire could hurt it, there's no reason why firearms couldn't, right? Well, to prevent such a scenario from playing out a second time, I decided to meet up with an old friend first. Well, keep his name anonymous. But he's a uh, hillbilly, so to speak. He lives in Missouri and has quite a collection of guns. I asked him if I could use one. Now, typically, you would think that he'd ask to know if I had a license. I don't, but I told him that it was for hunting in an obscure spot. Well, he spoke with a toothy whistle in his voice. I'd be obligated not to let you take my old shotgun, but you know, the founding fathers definitely said that it was every man's right, so I'll just look the other way if you really want to get that deer. I'm thankful that he was not a smart guy. Plus, it's probably good that I'm not bringing him along either. He'd go out blabbing it to all his bar buddies. I thanked him for the shotgun and told him that I'd return it soon enough. I went back to my car and began the short drive back into Illinois to get that cure or to get that vendetta settled. As I got back into my car, I could feel a soreness developing around the wound. The pain was getting worse. I found myself entering the town again. My emotions were catching up to me, although it seems to have changed since I was last here. A lot of the houses are emptied and have police tape wrapping all around the doorposts. Before I made my stop at the motel, I decided to stop at a supermarket to get some food and also information about what was going on. Though given the circumstances, I had quite a good hunch already. After getting some trail mix, I went up to a pretty blonde lady who looked to be about my age and asked, Hmm, seems pretty quiet around here. She seemed apprehensive about my question, so I tried to get her to speak by asking further. I'm curious about why that is. Has there been a wave of crime going on? Yeah, she muttered under her breath, scanning the bag. I looked around and saw that nobody was making eye contact with me. It would seem that everyone knew the answer. But I was tired of the tense atmosphere and decided to cut to the chase. It's because of that thing in the woods, I said flatly. She froze in place, her eyes becoming wider, and I could even see a little sweat dripping down her forehead. Looks like I had hit the nail on the head. Oh, I don't think we should be talking about that. Well, I'm pretty sure we need to. An older gentleman intervened and said with a throaty voice, 
How about you back it up? Things have been bad enough with that malevolent creature. Hmm, is that so? Why is it attacking the town? From what I heard, it shouldn't only attack those who get too close to its neck of the woods. She finished up the sale and quickly handed over my bag. It's angered. After some idiot burned down that house, it became restless and violent. Don't go looking for it if you know what's good for you. Well, ignoring the idiot comment, I thought about how unfortunate it was, because that's exactly what my whole reason for being there was. Also, better leave out the part where I was the guy who was partially responsible for burning the house. So, uh, this happened after the house burned down? She remained silent, but the older man spoke for her. Uh, that was a few months after. I heard that it's been walking around like a man, picking off people who thought they'd be safe in their homes. I find it odd that only a little while after it started attacking, but I guess it's not important. He's attacking these innocent people and I have to stop him after causing his death and misery. Now I have that guilt to haunt me. I won't let him continue this. So I grabbed my stuff and looked at both of them and said, Well, try to be safe. Later I returned to where my old house used to be. The building was still a bunch of ashes that had long since stopped burning. I can't believe it was almost a year since that whole incident. I still hate how that real estate agent managed to trick me into thinking that this would be a cheap fixer-upper. Uh, from this point on, I'm no longer taking chances on houses that are out in the middle of nowhere, decaying, or near woods. Going into the backyard, I stood at the edge of the cliff face. Shotgun wrapped around my shoulder and carrying a hunting knife, just in case the rotten animal got too close for comfort. Oh, my arm was killing me now. The pain was becoming more excruciating than before. My veins were getting browner with each pass, nearly reaching my shoulder. The only thing I could do at this point was assume that killing him would cure me. That or I'd at least get some measure of revenge. But it's an intelligent creature. Perhaps I could reason with him first. The loud howl of an elk shattered through the silence. I stared down into the woods to see two blue lights burning through. Not the body, just those malicious eyes staring back up at me. Hmm, so you know I'm here, I said to myself. Looking at the pathway down, I started my trek to the bottom, and when I reached it, I was met with a layer of dead animals everywhere, most of them being covered up by dead leaves that stretched all the way into the forest ahead. I had to psych myself up to keep going. Well, I was still having a few second thoughts to just go to a regular doctor, but again, I didn't want to be experimented on. So pressing forward, my thoughts wandered towards another potential source that might help me. Perhaps that priest or maybe some Native Americans had some insight on how to handle this beast. My mind was so fixated on revenge that I should have done a little more thinking down the line. Well, it was too late to turn back now. The air was rancid with rot, a symbol of how evil and deplorable this land was towards any man with a sense of civility. That grotesque creature had been ending the lives of hundreds of innocents for far too long. <sighs> Finally, I stepped out into a clearing, surrounded by trees and with a large pointed rock in the middle of the opening. I cautiously approached it, taking a look at the strange markings that had been painted and carved under the surface. The painting parts were similar to Neolithic cave drawings. There was a group of people huddled around a campfire. I transitioned over to some of them grabbing their spears and charging towards a being of blue, abstract, that was featured as streaks of lightning. The hunters appeared to try their best to attack it, and this seemed to work to a degree as the next transition depicted the blue streaks wandering off into the forest. Well, I was taken aback by all of this. What could the blue streaks mean? Why did ancient humans want to fight that of all things? I walked over to the other side of the rock, only to see that there was another depiction that had been painted on it. It showed a circle and featured another circle that was much smaller, falling in towards the big one. Then the next part showed the circle erupting with blue streaks that spread across the land until it found the decayed remains of a dinosaur. I took a few steps back until I realized just what this meant. The bones and rotten flesh got up on its hind legs and began wandering across the land, collecting more body parts from the remains of other dinosaurs. 
the way it had been depicted was enough to look just like that monstrosity. Oh, no way, I said in shock. Oh, are you finally connecting the pieces? I turned around and saw that giant bag of bones standing behind me a way off. He said calmly, Trespassing again. Oh, how typical of a human. I tried to intimidate him. Listen, I've got a shotgun and I'm not afraid to render you nothing more than a pile of bones this time around. I got set on fire last time we met. What makes you think a shotgun stands a chance? Well, he had me there, but I came with a little insurance too. Without my friend realizing it, I'd also swiped a few sticks of dynamite when he wasn't looking. If the shotgun wasn't able to disconnect all of his stolen body parts, I'm pretty sure an explosive round might be able to blow him back to dust. Well, guess we'll have to see. But I actually came back because I needed to know something. My arm. It's infected. I may have contracted a poison from the house. It's turning brown. I rolled up my sleeve to show him. He walked with the posture of a casual villain. His arms were wide behind his back and had this sinister stare aimed at me with those blue lights for eyes. Oh. <laughs> he chuckled. Looks like you got a little too close to my bathroom in the basement. How embarrassing of you. You're infected with whatever diseases I have crawling all over the remains of these animals that I used to move around in. Well, how about you cure me, and I don't fight you? That's an incredibly stupid plan. Did you actually believe that I'd help save your life after you burned my outhouse down? Angered by his statement, especially since that was a house and not a latrine, I swung the shotgun, cocked it, and kept my aim trained on his general location. You know, kind of figured you weren't going to help me. Part of me probably already knew that I wasn't going to survive much longer after our little spat. So I'm going to keep shooting you until you're a rotten carcass on this wretched ground. He dug his boots into the dirt, reached his arm back to pull out his broadsword, and with a snarling serpent-like hiss, he shouted, Come on over here and die faster then. I swallowed hard. This wasn't going to be an easy duel. I wasn't an insanely athletic guy, nor was I feeling a hint of bravery overtaking my actions. All I knew was that I was dying, and this evil was killing others because of my actions. Normally I would run away, but I was already cornered, so this was where I'd have to make my stand. Without thinking too hard, I pressed hard on the trigger and felt the kick immediately throw me back. I stayed on my feet just barely, but watched as the bullets of the shotgun tore through a section of the leather armor on this beast. He howled in rage and charged at me. I saw his sword coming right from my head, and with a sudden boost of adrenaline I ducked down and jumped to the side as fast as I could. The creature moved a lot slower than me, so I had a speed advantage. With a reload and another cock of the gun, I unloaded another shot into the monster, this time missing. Mm, from matches to bullets, I'm impressed, he said tauntingly. Well, still using a sword in a gunfight? Kind of lame, I spoke through labored breathing. It's good for cutting bodies up, he sadistically laughed. Seeing that another attack was about to happen, I had to reload quickly. Just as I was finished, he held his sword high and ran towards me at a much faster speed than I'd expected. I was expecting him to go for another swing, but he turned his body and managed to hit me with his shoulder, sending me flying through the air and landing near the tree line. That hit alone was enough to knock the wind right out of me. As I tried to get back up, still clutching the shotgun with as much tightness in my grip as I had left in me, the creature was already on top of me again, but I took aim at close range and was able to give him a harsh punishment when another blast of the shotgun shell completely took out the left section of his torso nearly detaching his arm. He howled, this time in apparent pain. <sighs> you filthy humans, always thinking you own everyone else that shares this world. We were the lords of these lands. You just outpopulated us into the obscure spots. Now you're just here to destroy us while we're on the verge of our extinction. 
I wasn't interested in hearing the rest of his sob story. This was survival of the fittest, and I was going to make sure this creature could never hurt anyone again. I had my gun aimed squarely at the head. Without any hesitation, I pressed the trigger hard and only heard a click. Oh, what the oh, crap? I spoke in defeat, realizing that I'd forgot to reload. He chuckled at my miscalculation and swiftly kicked me hard with his boot, sending me flying again, this time into a tree and tossing my gun away. But instead of trying to finish me off, he got on two feet and kept holding on to his most severe injury, that torso shot that I got on him. Oh, he did a number on me. It's been a while since a human had managed that. Whatever. You win. I know it sounded like defeat, but I was tired. The pain in the arm had managed to cause me to get weak faster, so I wasn't feeling like a good go on much longer. Not unless a miracle happened. He limped over and was about to use his sword on me. But out of nowhere, a pack of wolves made of stone and covered in patches of moss came from the woods and surrounded both of us. We both looked around in confusion, not quite sure where any of them had come from. That's when I heard the clapping of someone nearby. Well, if you're impressed by the human, then I'm overjoyed. Walking out into view from the top of the large boulder in the centre, a cloaked, hooded figure with long, pale white skeletal hands pressed together got our attention. Oh, you're another trespasser. Go back to your own land. He laughed hysterically upon hearing that, his voice being high-pitched and really condescending. You must be out of touch about what's been going on in the outside world. Don't you know we're in a war right now? Don't care, the monster replied. I only want to spend the rest of my eons here. The hooded figure dressed in white cloth stepped off from the top and slowly descended towards the ground. It reached towards its head and pulled the hood down to reveal a solid white head shaped like a human, but with no features other than a large gaping hole of a mouth the inside of which had rows upon rows of fangs. That's a shame on you, you walking animal corpse. I don't know why you bother using body parts. It's so degrading to our species. Don't preach to me about borrowing body parts. I already know you created that skin suit out of the remains of us humans. He shouted back with a snarl. The white figure chuckled. No matter. I'm going to be taking your land anyway. As if on cue, all of the stone wolves started pouncing onto the monster. They were tearing large sections of his body to pieces, slowly eating away at him. I tried my best to get up and run away, hoping to slip out from whatever drama these two were having. Holding onto my leg, I saw my shotgun nearby, grabbed it and booked it for the surrounding woods. I went as fast as my limping leg would allow, constantly looking around in paranoia. I didn't see any of those freaky wolves coming to look for me, though. <sighs> Got to hide, I mumbled under my breath. I looked at the barrel of my shotgun and reloaded it. Not going to be caught lacking a second time. Unfortunately for me, I was soon tackled and fell onto the side of a dirt mound. One of those stone wolves had pinned me and was starting to bite at me. Going through all of this reminded me of when I was a little boy and a dog bit my leg. I remember that dog bite quite well, but this was far more excruciating to go through. It was like a bear trap had already snapped its way to the bone in my left leg. I kept thrashing back and forth, intent on tearing it out, but in my desperate attempt to survive, I quickly aimed the barrel, not giving myself much time to make a calculation, closed my eyes, and I shot it in the skull. To my surprise, a spray of pebbles and bloody grey matter hit me in the face. I opened my eyes, startled to see an empty cavity of a liquefied brain. These moving statues were alive. Now both of my legs were in immense pain, and I needed somewhere to rest. I kept limping forward, spotting a nearby cave. Without any other options, I climbed in and rested on the largest boulder that was in there. For what felt like an hour, all I could do was breathe heavily and try to calm down my racing heart groaned and moaned from the fiery pain that was travelling at my legs. I was trapped in this forsaken forest, 
primordial monsters everywhere, and the number of bullets that I had left on me was starting to dwindle down into the last chance category. Oh, what am I going to do? I muttered. There was a sudden rumbling of stones nearby, and I quickly looked to my right to see what appeared to be a mesh of raccoon, groundhog, and warthog body parts stitched together with a skull of some unidentifiable animal. Blue lights for eyes. Oh, just my luck, I sighed loudly. He replied, Normally I'd kill you, but I'm hiding too and can't afford for you to scream like a whimpering child. Well then, consider us both cave buddies, I joked. He stared back at me, not breaking eye contact, and said coldly, No. For ten minutes it felt as if a century had passed. I never looked away from him, still convinced that if I did, he'd make short work of me and be able to feast afterward. You know, I could shoot you again. I tried to sound intimidating. He chuckled and rested on the rock. <laughs> You're not going to. You're too scared of our pursuer to do that. I'm not? R2, I still remember you trying to escape from the house like a scared little puppy. Yeah, because you're nothing more than a freak. You're so stupid. I don't actually look like this amalgamation of corpses. You read my rock. You could have figured it out. What are you? I instinctually moved closer. I told you before. I'm a being that lived here on Earth for millions of years. I leaned in closer still. Yeah, but what are you? I mean, I assume you're from outer space. That guy at the church told me. His head lowered slightly. We all are. We? I and hundreds of other primordials. We lived on this planet to expand our territory in the great cosmos above. But we're not actually life forms like you. He pointed at the blue light in the eye sockets of the skull. This is my true form. We resemble streaks of light and can take over any form of organic, or in some rare cases, inorganic material to create outer shells. So, you're made of light? Would my shotgun have killed you even? He laughed dismissively. Of course not. You are merely destroying the shell which I can always get more of, considering the number of animals that I like to have piled up. Although I still have to eat sometimes. Eat people, you mean? I coldly responded. Yes, but I haven't eaten for a while due to everyone staying away. Usually a few children dare their friends here, but ever since you burned down my house, even they have little reason to come by. His comment stuck with me. Something wasn't adding up. A bunch of people have gone missing around the town, and yet he says he hasn't eaten anyone for some time. Wait, but I heard that a lot of people have gone missing recently. I thought that was you. I don't know what you're talking about. I've only been eating the animals that still come around. It was slowly growing colder as nighttime approached. There was only an hour, maybe less, of sunlight left. I had nothing to make a fire with, and I didn't want to accidentally fall asleep with that thing in the cave. I had to come up with an idea on how to get rid of that rival and escape. Just then a spasm attack hit my arm, and it started shaking violently. I tried to hold it down, but the pain was like fire in it. I had sweat drenching my head, and I looked at him. He took note of my pain, but said nothing. Not that I expected comfort from him anyway. I had to hold my breath and try not to scream. I kept looking over at the monster and wondered if I could hold out much longer. I needed to come up with a way to avoid my early death and be cured. Hey, how about a proposal? I gritted my teeth, really not wanting to do this, but I knew I had no choice. Oh, what kind? He looked as if he was ready to shut it down already. Help my arm, and I'll help kill that rival of yours. He looked up and appeared to be in deep thought, but almost as quickly he turned back towards me and said, oh, I think I can take him. I have an extra body stashed in the back of this cave anyway. What? I gasped, and he smugly said, Just watch behind me. And just like that, the tiny corpse's body fell apart when the lights went out of its eyes. 
All of its little bones and scraps of meat fell apart, and from behind the rock, a large hand slowly caressed it. It was an exact replica of the original body from when I'd first met it. Why do you make all your bodies look the same? Oh, I thought it looked scary, and trust me, it's very scary when you're in the woods alone. Why did it take so long to get in that body? I asked, curiously. I needed to regenerate my light cells, grow back to size to effectively control this body. Now, shut up. As he made for the exit, I pleaded again, reminding him of the numerical disadvantage. He stopped and looked out at the sunset, pulled out a sword just like the old one, and spoke with a sneer. Usually I'd rather not work with your kind. You've destroyed the environment and pushed my race out of the greater world. But personally, I'd like to live to see your race die out. And if that means... There was a long pause between us. He exhaled. I don't think I'd be able to take on all of those wolves of his. Your shotgun might prove useful. He turned back towards me and laid his hand on my arm. There were zaps of static electricity that tickled my whole arm as he caressed it. The brown ooze was retreating out of my veins, and shortly afterward, my whole arm was fixed. Now, a deal's a deal. Don't go running off on me. And don't expect me to spare you after we beat them or go our separate ways. I'll give you one chance to get in your car and leave me be. Come back, and I will kill you. Well, I'll be honest, I did have half a mind to do exactly just that. And he could probably find me, and those wolves would likely tear me apart. We were going to have to, begrudgingly, work together to survive. Our march through the woods was rather peaceful. It was quiet. There was still sun out, but it was going down slowly. We had to find that other primordial before night time. That would be a disadvantage, but mostly for me, though. When we came back to the large boulder in the centre of the woods, it was as if What's-His-Name was issuing a second challenge for the rival to notice us. Is this the rock you came from? I asked. No, he coldly remarked. What makes you think an asteroid would survive the impact on this world? I don't know. I'm no good at astronomy. Clearly. He raised his skeletal snout to the sky and let out a piercing elk hollering. It was so loud, I actually had to cover my ears. God, he could have warned me. He ignored my angered request. Now they were coming. The patterning of feet running through leaves and coming from all directions around us was enough reason for me to prepare the shotgun. I gripped it tightly, keeping my eyes focused on the trees around us. He also raised his sword high and didn't seem unfazed. And then... Three of the stone walls came rushing out from the forest and tried to pounce on us. Their coordination was terrible, and that worked to our advantage. I started firing when I felt comfortable enough to hit them, happy that I had a shotgun because the spray of bullets instantly shattered the head of one of them, and my monstrous partner lunged forward and grabbed hold of one of them by the neck before smashing it down into the ground. This did not destroy the wolf, but his sword was plunged through the neck and snapped the wolf in two. The remaining wolf turned back, but my partner grabbed hold of it by the tail and pulled it back, winging it up into the air and then crashing it back down into the ground. The head exploded with a gush of brain matter spraying everywhere. These things only have brains? I inquired. He got down and licked the horrid mess. Mm, it tastes like a human. Why would they be human brains? Well then, the realization hit me like a freight train. All of the people going missing around here, and my partner not having anything to do with it. That could only mean that whatever this thing is, it was the one kidnapping people around the town and stuffing their brains inside these statues. Oh, I see you found my little secret. A vile humanoid came walking out from the woods. I'd rather you stop destroying my stone slabs. It takes me some time to make one, but... These human brains are exceptionally useful in making them come to life. I clenched hard on the trigger, not pressing it just yet. But my anger was at a boiling point, and I immediately took aim. 
Oh, <laughs> what a brave little human. Hey, Kushim, is this little human your friend? I looked up at the monster next to me and said, Kushim, is that your name? Yes. He looked at me and turned his eyes back. But how did you hear about it? The rival snickered like a malevolent trickster. You really think I didn't read anything that you drew on that rock behind you? I briefly looked back and knew for certain that there were more secrets hidden away on this massive boulder. What other secrets did it hide? Enough talk. Let's fight. And Kushim ran towards the intruder. I found myself keeping watch for more of the stone wall. The two of them were battling it out. Titanic fight and I knew I'd get one shot at if I even tried to intervene. Standing guard was my only option. Although I felt a mix of hesitation and fear, considering that these were humans that had been forcibly turned into mindless slaves. I was killing them, but then I, I couldn't think like that. I knew there was a human brain in there, but they were just a body to be in control by that thing. I had to do what's right and free them from their enforced servitude. Sparks of light were exploding off both of them, blue and green lights twisting around each other in violent arrays that sent shockwaves through the land and the air. Kushim was an incredibly intimidating beast, a vicious animal that wouldn't quit fighting until there was no more strength left in him. But it was clear to me that this fight was becoming more one-sided. The pale-skinned humanoid rival was effortlessly dodging his attacks, only getting hit whenever Kushim used his fists instead of the sword. Why was he so attached to that primitive weapon? It wasn't doing him any good, and he should just make this more of a brawl since that was proving a more successful strategy. I was just about ready to move in and assist when another wolf snuck up behind me, and I had to use the shotgun to block its mouth from biting my face off. It kept trying to snap its jaws more, slowly crushing and breaking the shotgun, uh, if I didn't get it off quickly, that is. The rival managed to use lightning-fast punches at Kushim's chest, and he fell down with one knee almost completely giving out. And then, I remembered, I still had that stick of dynamite on me, as well as the knife. I pulled out the knife first, and with all my strength I shoved it into the eye. Now, well, imagine trying to stab a stone. I saw the blade was going to break and slice in my hand in the process. The wolf released, and I quickly blew its head apart. Catching my breath, I watched as the intruder pinned Kushim to the ground. He gloated. How sad. You actually believed you stood a chance. I've already enthralled eight others before you, and they were far more powerful. He was so hyper-focused on his prey that I could slowly approach from behind. He continued. No matter. Once I subjugate you, I'll go on to the next few left, and all the others will have to abide by my rule. Kashim tried to scratch him, but the rival had broken both arms in the struggle. Oh, how pathetic. Now, kneel before me and join my army, he ordered, forcing his foot down harder on Kashim's chest, but he only growled back. Well, fine then. Any last words? He taunted, with his sharpened claws raised up. Kashim saw me and said, Only that you're done for. And right behind him I said, You shouldn't doubt humans. He turned around, confused about how I was able to move so close, only to stare down two barrels of the gun. I fired and it managed to splatter a huge chunk of his head to pieces. He fell off and quickly tried to pull his head together as the green light was escaping out. And Kushim took this opportunity, getting to his feet and repeatedly starting to smash his foot down on the torso of his rival. And I knew this wasn't going to work. There was only one way to kill him, so I quickly grabbed the dynamite and lit it. I yelled, Kushim, out of the way! He turned around and knew what I was doing the moment he saw me throw the sparkling stick. He quickly jumped away and the stick just managed to run out of fuse as it was on top of our enemy. He let out a tormented scream before the explosion engulfed him in a small plume of smoke and shock. I was momentarily unable to hear anything as the shock had set in. 
Beams of light started to rise above us, and Kashim held out his arms, absorbing the light into his body. But just for that moment, it felt as if I'd really accomplished something that day. We'd beaten it. I looked around and saw Kashim limping away. We stared at each other for a good while. He nodded at me, and I gave him a soft smile. Well, the deal was over. I got up and walked in the opposite direction, back up to the cliff face and to my car that waited for me. And so, the last I heard, there were no more people going missing. After going through that excitement, I was truly more interested now than before in the unusual and unnatural secrets that exist in this world. Monstrous light-based aliens that have come down to our world, a war that's brewing, and an overwhelming excitement to try and stop whatever forces are gathering from plunging the rest of the world into chaos. Well, I don't have a lot of money for travel, and there's a need out there for people who are willing to risk everything and see what other nightmares are waiting to be discovered. But who knows? Maybe Kashim would like the insurance that no others are going to come around on his territory. I'd much rather have that threshold of evil be a starting point for resistance against a greater threat that has already got its deadly sights on us all. My name is Henry. And this is the start of my monster hunting career. So I was very happy to see this. I thought that was a standalone story from a few months ago. wasn't expecting a second part. Uh, it's um, always a popular theme, um, one that I even did on Sunday. <laughs> it's done this, isn't like Monsters in the Woods, scripts and things like that. So yeah, pretty quick to uh, go back to that one. But anyway, yeah, so I was really happy to see that there was a second part to this, which drove the story on in a really good way. May turn into a series, well, we'll see. Anyway, so yeah, Monday already. Back again on Wednesday. Then podcast on th oh, th these weeks they just go by so quickly. They really do, but you're all still here, and that makes it worthwhile for me to keep going as well. As long as you're still around, I will be too. Well, my dear friends, that is enough for one evening. Back again very soon. Till the next time. Very, very sweet dreams, and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.